So, so we just have here in person, we just have myself and Sam. Pam, right? Yeah, so okay. and that is all that we expect in person. In person, okay. Yes. Without a quorum? No, no. Uh, you don't. You need six. Not yet. Right now there's five. That count said he was coming, so he may still be. Okay, yeah. Line. And we all aren't like, really have any action items tonight, so. My apparel is on. Yes. I've heard it all before. I've got that stressful. Okay. I heard a wire old ladies razzle. Jeff Harold, Jason. So oh, Sam, Jason, we Jeff, just had a family thing, so that's good. And then we're just waiting. Except Except for for minutes. Minutes. We but just haven't heard yet from people. Yes, you're right. Nothing okay. important. <laughs> well, well, then we would have to do the minutes the next meeting. Well, right? Did Tim Wilson get back with you? Nor Kane, nor um, Kane and Tim. I left a message with. I never yeah. heard anything back. And Michelle with the question mark. James with the question mark. What about Adam? Did you ever hear from him? Adam he said he couldn't, couldn't make it. He can't make it. Yeah. Schedule oh, change. Okay. Should we just wait a little bit? It's just now on to six, so we could wait a couple minutes and see if if Tom jumps online. Okay. And maybe. You never know. If yeah. Maybe they were all sent Webex invites. Okay, maybe yeah. There's only um the only two I there are two vote items the agenda and the minutes. But right. can we do the approval of the agenda even if we don't have a quorum? We can agree by consensus. Okay. Mm -hmm. What about the minutes? We should maybe wait vote on those yeah. next time. Mm -hmm. Okay. We could. Are things good up there on in the lower part of Core Sound? Things, things good up there in Core Sound. Oh, they're super hectic. Yeah, we've got our lifetime we're at uh, lifetime member event this weekend. Our point. Oh, okay. With a band and all this kind of business, I've got the. Uh, Wrap scallops and bacon. Is this at the music? <laughs> That's going to take me all Friday to get them wrapped. Yeah. And then I got to cook them. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, Lord. This is at the at the museum. It's at, we're doing it, but we're not having it at the museum. We're having it at the Maxwell property at Harper's Point. Okay. The other end of the island. Okay. So we, we have the political events there. That they hire us to do the food and everything. That's been a long time. So this is going to be a big shindig. But other than that, I was in Wilmington actually last weekend. Oh, okay. And my daughter, grandchild was playing travel softball oh, at down, a tournament here. Down in Wilmington. My sister lives there on Mimosa, in between Mimosa and Oleander. That oh, section okay. by Country Club Road. Yeah, yeah. Right there. Okay. She lives right there, so we went and saw her and Okay. You know. It was enjoyable. I like coming to Wilton. Yeah. So we may be up your way on Friday because we're oh, yeah. trying to put out some satellite tags on Southern Flounder now mm -hmm. closed with Eddie. With Eddie. Right. Brooks. Right. Yeah, I just so, saw Eddie. Yeah. Leaving the island. So yeah, we were gonna go tomorrow, but he he said it was nastier today than he thought it was going to be. So he said, let's mm -hmm. give it another day. And yeah, he had to wait for the wind to lay down. It was blowing a storm at home today. Yeah, that's what he said. He was out long hauling, I guess, for spots last week. Okay. They took some good pictures. Yeah. There. Because he's, a, so he's, he's a, one of the only ones that still does that. And his net is a, is categorized as a fin fish net because he does some sheep head stuff, too. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 uh, He's been really good about keeping it open for us after the Flounder's been closed the last right. few years so we can get tags out. Yeah. And he's he catches a big fish. So Yeah, he's good about that. But his pounds are up, I think. I don't Pro think yeah. his pounds are down. Yeah, he probably put them up and then he, yeah. then he said he would put them back down after the weather gotcha. changed. Because we're trying to we're trying to get to the fish. Mm-hmm. The, the day after they get caught. So we're trying to go when we go with him, we're going to try to go 
as many consecutive days as we can. Mm -hmm. Luckily, it's convenient because we meet him at his house and it's only right. like a 10 minute boat ride. Exactly. So he can go every day and just see if there's any big fish. Yeah. We don't really know how the duration in the pound affects their migratory ability. In other mm -hmm. words, you know, if it just resets them, so to speak. And so we're trying to minimize that if we can. I got gotcha. you. As opposed to them being in there for three or four days. And then well, if it's if they got their pounds down, they they go to them every day, pretty yeah. much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have to let if they have any turtles or whatever, they have to let them escape and all that stuff. Yeah, that's right. So they pretty much go every day when the pounds are down, but they're yeah. they're not down now, obviously. So there's Tom. Yeah, Tom. Pardon? How big are Hi, Tom. Pounds? Can we get a sound they're, check they're, from they're you, big. please? I mean, you know, it, it just the depends. lead is long. The pound is the pound's not that big. The lead uh, goes out. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, sounds can, great. Yeah, Thank you. His, his pounds, I'd say, are about twice the size of this table. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The pound itself isn't big. Yeah. You got the heart, and then you got the pound. So. Okay. Cool. All right. So we have Tom. All right. So we have a. Uh, Tom, you Tom, you gave us a quorum. <laughs> Good. I so, had a meeting um, last night where I didn't have a quorum because my secretary right. couldn't get on. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> okay, so we can call the meeting to order. Um, so this is the October nineteenth, twenty twenty two meeting of the Southern Regional Advisory Committee, um, and I'm Fred Scharf, and I serve as the the chair of the committee. Jerry James is the vice chair, but he's not he's not here tonight. Um, and we have several members here in attendance. So we'll just have the members that are here and the folks that are on the WebEx just briefly introduce themselves and then we'll we'll move forward with the, the two items we need to vote on real quick. So I'll let you go ahead, Sam. What do I need to say? Yeah, Sam. Yeah, Sam. Or is Sam was okay. Let's see everybody. Yep. Pam Morris. Okay. So we have Sam and Pam that are in here. And then on the WebEx, we have Tom Smith. Tom Smith, I'm here. Okay. We have Jason Fowler. Yeah, Jason's here. Okay. And then Jeff Harrell. Yeah, Jeff is here. Okay, good. So we have we have a quorum. So the um, you guys should have all received the agenda electronically by email and um, we just need to vote to approve the agenda which is going to be a commission update and some meeting planning overview and a little bit of updates on some fmps that are ongoing and then we need to vote to approve the minutes for the march 16th meeting so can i have a motion from someone to approve the agenda i'll make the motion okay so I'll second it, tom smith will Okay, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, good. Um, and then you also should have received a copy of the minutes from the March 16th, 2022 meeting. Um, the majority of that meeting was focused on the estuarine striped bass fishery management plan. So we had lots of discussion and heard quite a bit of public comment, and we made some recommendations on that fishery management plan amendment um, throughout, the, throughout the course of that meeting. There is one correction to the minutes. It's on the eighth page. It was just a misspelling of Sam's last name. So it says Sammy Boyd, B-O-Y-D, instead of Sam Boyce. Um, and that's been corrected in the official set of minutes. Um, I, I read through the minutes last week, I think I had them, and uh, just because it had been so long since that meeting and I wanted to refresh my memory and, and uh, what I read sort of aligned with what I remember we talked about and um, we made some votes. So does anybody have any comments about those minutes, any concerns before we vote to approve those? No concerns here. Anybody? No. Okay. So, can we get a motion to approve the March 16, 2022 minutes? Motion to approve. 
Second it. So Sam and Pam seconded. So do we, can we approve that? All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. All right. So those are the only two voting items we have tonight. Normally those are the first two and then we have lots of others, but tonight we don't have anything else to vote on. It's going to be a very informational meeting. So Laura is going to provide a, an update first from the commission and then, uh, and then talk some about the annual planning process for meetings for the 2023 calendar year. And then Corin's going to, Give us some FMP updates. So I'll let Laura go first. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman Scharf. You're welcome. <laughs> um, all right. So um, first, thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, as um, as Fred said, we don't have any um, official action other than your um, first two votes. Um, however, I did want to um, be able to provide you with an update. We have a lot going on with FMPs um, and. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to meet and also for the 2023 calendar and, and sort of meeting plan for the next year, um, which I'll talk about after the update. Um, so I do want to remind everyone, we do have the microphone on here in the center of the table. Uh, it's pretty sensitive, um, but in some cases it can be a little too sensitive. So if people are trying to hear online, if we're all talking, it can be disruptive. So just um, keep that in mind while we're talking. Um, and um, we, uh, so it's been, we've had two meetings since you last met in March. We had the May um, and the August business meeting. So I'm going to cover um, uh, those meetings by topic and I'll try to uh, let you know when things happened for those. Um, first, uh, we have had, before the August meeting, we had four new commissioners appointed to the Marine Fishery Commission. Um, they are, uh, they, three of them were sworn in at the August meeting. That was Anna Shellam, Donald Huggins, and Doug Rader. Doug Rader, uh, he is replacing Pete Cornegie, who resigned um, for personal reasons back in, I believe it was March or April. And um, so uh, Chairman Rader will, excuse me, um, Commissioner Rader will uh, continue the uh, Pete Cornegie's term. So his, uh, that's through 2023. Um, Anna Shellam is uh, replacing Sam Romano in the commercial seat. Um, she is also from this area, so she's from uh, Wrightsville Beach. Uh, and then Donald Huggins um, is replacing Tom Hendrickson in one of the at-large seats. Um, at your next, or at the next meeting in November, there will be one additional uh, commissioner. She was out of town for the August meeting, but she is Sarah Gardner and she will be sworn in um, hopefully before the FinFish AC meeting and she'll be attending that meeting um, before the November commission meeting. Um, and so uh, the dynamics are different on the commission, so we're interested to see. I'm interested. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm interested in, in how that November meeting um, is going to go. It's always nice to have fresh opinions and things like that. Um, we are also in the uh, AC solicitation period, so uh, that opened mid-September. Um, we are soliciting through November 1st. Um, so we have had, last year we had, um, an up, we saw an uptick in applications. We are looking for applicants for all of the advisory committees. Um, in addition to that, you will be hearing from uh, staff. If your term is up at the end of this year, you'll be hearing from staff um, asking if you would like to continue to serve. And if you would, then um, we'll just need to get an application for you. So you'll be put back into the um, pool. So uh, again, that will, somebody will contact you about that. If you know already and that your term is expiring and you want to tell me tonight, that's also fine. Um, the appointments uh, should be made by December 1st, so everyone should know if they've been appointed or not um, December 1st. Let's see. All right, so um, the two AC meetings. So like I said, we had the May and the November. Um, in the May and the August. <laughs> and um, first I'm going to touch on River Herring. Um, that was approved um, at the November meeting. Um, and that was an information update, uh, and that was approved 
uh, as an information update because the uh, Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission is currently um, has a stock assessment underway for river herring. So um, staff recommended that the um, that we wait on management changes or consideration of management changes until that stock assessment was completed. Um, so for the time being, the information update was completed. For Southern Flounder, um, in May, the commission gave final approval on the Amendment 3. And Corinne's going to go into a little bit more about implementation of the management measures that were included as part of that plan. Um, but that completed uh, the cycle of Amendment 3. Um, for Stripe Mullet, um, during the May meeting, the commission were presented with the stock assessment report on Stripe Mullet. And um, the stock assessment determined the uh, striped mullet stock to be overfished and overfishing was occurring. So the next step um, was scoping. That has taken place now. Um, and of course, you can, if you would like to talk about that more tonight, we can. Corinne will go over that a little bit more as well. Um, but the commission um, in no uh, November will be hearing about the outcome of that scoping period. And they will also be reviewing and approving the goal and objectives for amendment um, to for strike mullet. Um, and we do have um, Jeff Dobbs here. He's one of the strike uh, mullet leads if we have any questions about that. So I'll ask him to come up to the table in a little bit. Uh, so for, let's see. Um, next, we have striped bass. So, like Fred said, you discussed striped bass at your last meeting. Um, the commission select they did select their preferred management measures um, for Amendment Two at their May meeting. Um, and as you are all fully aware, the gillnet issue in the CSMA um, area has dominated a lot of the conversation around that amendment. Um, but there are other pieces of that, um, specifically in the uh, Albemarle Roanoke Sound that we're um, hoping will also come to the top of the pile um, in November. Uh, at the August meeting, the commission were originally scheduled to give final approval for that amendment. However, the new commissioners were brought on pretty late, so they uh, it, it effectively they tabled it until November. Um, that gave the new commissioners a chance to catch up on the issues. And um, I think probably after your discussion in March, you can probably all appreciate wanting to be caught up on that <laughs> before making any final decisions. Um, so um, in November, they will be reviewing the um, commission's preferred management measures and discussing that um, again. So also in November, um, the spotted sea trout assessment, stock assessment um, is going to be presented um, as well as the outcome of the peer review. Um, and so that will be just an informational update um, and then we'll start to uh, work on the FMP after that. Is, is that assessment um, a DMF assessment or a, an Atlantic States assessment? It is a DMF assessment and um, I don't know if you know Yan Lee, she is, she's is she been the lead on that one. She's been working with someone at NC State. Um, they've been developing um, a model that takes into account sort of the biology of the fish more. That was one of the suggestions during the last stock assessment. So they've been working on that model. I think, yeah, she's probably working with Jay Chow. I think so. I think mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Does, does, but spotted sea trout. <clears throat> There's an inter, inter jurisdictional management plan through ASMFC. So does, but does does each of the states within do their own assessments? So it's the in this assessment, it's Virginia and North Carolina. Okay. Um. So yeah, that is taking that, the lead on it. Correct, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And if we have Virginia data. I don't think that they otherwise participate. Yeah. No, they, 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 they we have people they? on the okay. PDT from Virginia. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. And um, I mean, going into the weeds on this, but um, it is just the stock. Um, and so you know, spotted sea trout multiple stocks right. along the coast. Um, and it is just the stock north of Wilmington. 
Okay. So um, the Cape Fear actually is not part of our stock assessment. Okay. So it's sort of the northern part of the state in Virginia, that stock that's being assessed, because right? Because genetics show that um, the Cape Fear is, is a mixing zone between the um, southern stock and the North Carolina Virginia stock. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, I have a couple of other smaller items. Um, at one of our meetings, uh, especially Commissioner Blanton has um, brought up concerns about blue catfish. Um, this has begun to be more of a conversation um, in the Alphamal Sound, just generally uh, blue catfish and their impacts on other fish stocks. And so um, we uh, have been, um, the commission uh, hasn't officially, but we've discussed the need to um, continue looking at um, blue catfish more actively. Um, and the division has started to increase um, data collection around uh, blue catfish and also, um, I don't know how much we've worked with Virginia, um, but Virginia's sort of ahead of the game uh, from us just because they've had blue catfish um, in, invasion longer than we have. So, um, yeah, we've, we've mainly just participated in some of their um, workshops, okay. some of their catfish workshops that they've been doing over the last couple of years, right. which started our participation with that back when I was the invasive species lead. So we've right. been doing that for about four years now. Okay, yeah. So, and we have also started to collect um, diet mm -hmm. information. We're expanding our diet and, um, research in that area. Right. So we're working on blue catfish. There's nothing official yet, but it is on the radar, basically, at the commission table. Um, uh, in addition, the commission did request that the division draft a letter to the South Atlantic Council um, addressing the dolphin issue. So the dolphin amendment was recently, um, I believe it was completed. Um, however, there have been sort of continuing discussions about bag limits um, and the Commission requested that the division um, basically oppose any further changes to that fishery at this time, and um, the director has agreed to that. So we are working on that letter, and that's going to go out in um, December to the South Atlantic's December meeting. Um, also, we are going to be updating um, a white paper on false albacore. It was originally um, done in 2017. However, um, Commissioner uh, Roller and also um, Commissioner Rader expressed interest in um, looking at sort of what possible options um, in North Carolina there are for management of false albacore. Um, they are a highly migratory species, so it's not clear that there's anything um, that would be valuable just for state waters, but it's certainly a discussion, sort of a broader discussion of these fish that aren't currently managed, uh, you know, what are our thoughts on should we be regulating or at least monitoring those um, in state waters? Um, and then the next meeting for the commission is going to be held in November. Um, it's going to be November 16th through the 18th at the Islander Hotel in Emerald Isle. And that was the same location we were at last November as well. Um, and that is my update, unless there are questions. Just, you know, on the blue catfish issue, just an FYI that um, Jim, Jim Morley at ECU and I submitted a proposal mm -hmm. for funding to, to look at blue catfish in the Western Albemarle and Roanoke and Shelton Rivers just to do a, a, a uh, trophic analysis, diet, stable isotopes, some genetic work, mm -hmm. um, and so um, we haven't we haven't heard any whether they've they've um, decided to fund that work or not. But if they do, it would start the spring. Okay. So thank you. He would we would each have a, a student, a graduate student, and then mm -hmm. we have field sampling scheduled throughout, like, okay. you know, spring, summer, fall mm -hmm. for blue catfish. Nice. We would do some electrofishing mm -hmm. and some gill netting and then partner with some of the commercial netters in the western part of the sound. Yeah. <laughs> We've actually talked about um, Janelle Johnson was our blue, cra blue 
blue crab and blue catfish biologist mm -hmm. um, before she left. She gave a presentation at the May meeting yeah. um, about blue catfish, and they were talking about the um, there's been some interest in a commercial fishery using electrofishing gear. Right. Um, which is yeah, we've really talked to Charlton about that. To okay. Be, yeah. You know, just gave him our experiences here mm -hmm. with that gear working on flathead catfish here. Okay. Yeah. And so it's a good it's a good the the low frequency electrofishing is really good in targeting those scaleless catfish. Mm -hmm. um, it's has almost no bycatch. The only thing is we catch are those two species, mm -hmm. but it has some limitations in that it um, it really only works well when the water temperature is above about 18 degrees, mm -hmm. um, ideally like above 22 or so, but you can, it'll work both down to 15, but it's not as efficient. Right. And so it's, um, it's kind of a warm weather. Yeah. Gear. It's pretty interesting mm -hmm. um, thought as a commercial gear. Yeah. I thought. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So that, concludes my Marine Fishery Commission update. Okay. Um, and for, would you like me to move on to my uh -huh. next? Okay. Sure. So, so I sent out, uh, so hopefully you have the uh, 2023 calendar. Um, and we have them here uh, on the desk in front of us. Um, we have, uh, we do this every year about this time. We basically set a schedule for the coming year. And we, um, I use it to begin to make contracts for all of our meeting event locations and things like that for the commission meeting. But we also set the advisory committee meetings. And um, <laughs> in the past few years, um, and certainly since I started, the advisory committees have not met unless there was an issue for you to vote on. Um, and so in an effort to, um, get you together basically more frequently so that you can have meetings like this where there are no contentious issues um, and we can talk about either issues that you're interested in just give you updates um, i have proposed that we have um, basically the standard number of meetings so be four meetings quarterly and it would be january um, april uh, i think it's july and then october um, and next year, the only meeting where we anticipate you having an action item is actually the October 2023 meeting. So that would be for striped mullet, um, I believe. Yeah. Stay on time. Exactly. So it's anticipated. It's not set in stone. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, we have January and April. Um, in January, we will have new advisory committee members. So um, we have um, planned to have uh, one of our stock assessment scientists give sort of a basic overview of stock assessments and how we do them and what all the different terms are and things like that. Um, and, and certainly an opportunity just for you guys to ask questions if you have anything, uh, especially with the number of species that are coming up, uh, spotted sea trout being one of um, interest for most people. Um, so. That would be, um, we would anticipate that being a WebEx meeting. Um, and what we're, what we're considering is doing basically alternating WebEx with in-person meetings. So January would be WebEx, April would be in-person, July would be WebEx, and then we'd be in-person again in October. Um, and so uh, this is actually for you to Give me feedback. Does that sound like a good idea? Do you want to meet all four times? Um, do you want to be in person versus WebEx? Things like that. Um, we do try to have the hybrid option always just because we can do that now. And it's nice if people, if they can't make it to the building, then they can still participate. So um, we'd really like to have feedback, honestly, uh, what you think or any ideas you have. I, I always prefer to meet in person. I mean, I just I just do mm -hmm. what I'm used to, and I'd rather be here mm -hmm. in the flesh. WebEx is uh, just annoys me. Mm -hmm. uh, everything does. So <laughs> big deal. That's not a big deal at all. But I know to, to gain a quorum, it's difficult to gain a quorum now, yeah. especially since now this you've only got. 
northern and southern and they're so big mm -hmm. before we were in the central committee mm -hmm. so we had better attendance you know yeah. because you didn't have to drive so far so i think you're going to have to have these blended meetings just get a quorum mm -hmm. it's tom there he's in charlotte somewhere yeah so i mean it's because there's no inland committee anymore so yeah i think but i just personally I don't mind driving, obviously, and and I just like to be able to have the option to be in person. Mm -hmm. So because of the open meeting laws, um, the state of emergency due to COVID was lifted um, a while back now, and the open meeting laws require that we have a listening station. So we will always have a place where you could come participate. Mm -hmm. um, that will always be an option moving forward. So even if we say it's an all WebEx meeting, we have to have a listening station. So we would have that option. Um, we might, cause of staffing, we might request that we do it at CDO in Moorhead City um, if that's not too inconvenient. But um, especially for these informational meetings, if there's, if we're not expecting a lot of turnout from a big crowd or anything like that, we might try to just have it more centralized. Yeah. It depends on what it is, too. Like, Strike Mullet, you're going to have uh, our crowd were mainly yeah. the ones that are fishing for Strike Mullet. So, yeah. it's going to be be better if that meat was in Moorhead. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, because you're going to get more And if it were something more pertinent to the southern area, it'd obviously be yeah. better down here. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Pam that I, I, I always like the in person meetings. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think more because we get. I think sometimes at, at the WebEx meetings, we don't really get to know each other mm -hmm. very well. Mm -hmm. I think it helps when we get to know people on the committee and have a chance to catch up and talk about things. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times in the past, people would just hang around after the meeting and stay and catch up on other stuff and just talk. Right. So yeah. We get to know each other that way. And so the more of that we can do, it's, it's great. Has there, has there ever been, is there any consideration of going back to three coastal committees when we had a northern central southern um, uh, just because like pam said it makes it easier for the local folks to drive and meet in person because right. they're all closer yeah um, i have to look at the at the statute i don't remember if it was was it changed at the statute level no let's like not this okay. lewis daniel changed that Okay. Was it, I it, thought it was sort of budgetary or something. It, at the time. it might have, and I will say this: I know that the commission office used to have five employees. Right, right now, there's me. Right. Um, and I will soon have an assistant. And of course, Catherine Bloom is the rulemaking coordinator. She's mm -hmm. now in my office, but she's the rulemaking coordinator. Right. Right. Um, so I I think that it could be that the staff availability um, is an issue. It certainly is an issue right now. Um, right. So in terms of, you know, having these meetings, so for mm -hmm. example, you know, Hope and Debbie and I just drove to Manio yesterday and then we drove down here today and then we're right. at CDO tomorrow and then we're at CDO twice next week. So right. just the reality of yeah. having to staff those meetings can be challenging. So that's why we're proposing a couple of hybrid or uh, WebEx meetings so that we can maybe just reduce the um, administrative burden, basically. And if it's acceptable to the committee, if you feel like these update meetings are OK, um, but certainly for strike mullet in October, that would be in person. So if there's, yeah. especially if there's um, something on the um, on the docket for that meeting, but also I think um, one thing I have heard from all of the committees is that when you sit down to make these really tough decisions, um, because you don't meet regularly, it's a lot harder. Mm -hmm. um, and I've heard a lot of the committee members say that they don't feel prepared. Right. So part of meeting regularly is to feel prepared when you sit down at this table for those kinds of well, more contentious. Well, it started off you know, quarterly. Right. Everybody met quarterly. Yeah. Right. But I guess as <laughs> as staff has shrunk mm -hmm. and the importance and emphasis on what these advisory committees has also shrunk. There's just like say, I remember Lewis with he brought, he said that it was for budgetary 
um, yeah. it was a budgetary issue. But it was still, it was being very difficult because we're so, the central region is so unlike, this very unlike the southern mm-hmm. fish people. And we're much more like the northern committee mm-hmm. than we are at the southern. But, mm-hmm. you know, it is what it is. They just cut cut it right in half. It was like open coke is on the northern committee. Yeah. And all, all of our, <laughs> that's who we fish with. It's open yeah. committee. Yeah. So, you know, it's even if it were pushed down to Beaufort Inlet, you know, mm-hmm. and if it was north of Beaufort Inlet, where of course Sam was in the, the northern district, I mean, the southernmost point in the Central Committee was Highway 58 Bridge, mm-hmm. right? And north from there all the way to Mans Harbor. Mm-hmm. It's what the old district looked like. Yeah. But those fishermen just yeah. fish so much more like bodies of water are different yeah and it's just a totally different thing and i when i first started coming to the southern committee meeting i was like leaving scratching my head i was like i do not understand these people i don't don't understand their thinking how they think about Mm -hmm. what they have to do and and it was just perplexing but anyway yeah i will say that uh in Initially, uh, my first year of going through the AC solicitation period, um, we struggled to get enough applicants to fill even the current ACs. Um, So uh, when Director Rawls came on, um, she certainly has made a push for additional outreach and trying to engage more with the public and with stakeholders. And so it's just become more of a priority. And um, last year we had, many more applicants so that was really um hopefully an indication of people are getting more interested or at least more knowledgeable about the fact that these exist they can sit on it Mm -hmm. um, and you know and and have an input so um, i think that what might happen is if interests continue to grow that might be a good point when we consider if we have enough applicants across the state yeah, that that could be, and and it will no. depend on staffing and things. Like it that. will, it will, and it'll. You know, I I just wish there were more like general commercial fishermen. Mm-hmm. These things. I mean, I I'm like Fred. I've sat on this thing for long time, a long time since the beginning, mm-hmm. since the first committee, and it just seems like in the past we had a lot more commercial fishermen mm-hmm. who were willing to serve yeah but they've been disgusted pretty much by the whole process yeah and i just wish there would be a we change had, we had some good old scientists too <laughs> but <they're not laughs> we did we had great scientists we had i was the, i was the young guy committee but we had <laughs> yeah. we had um dick stone and and um on the southern one we had dick stone and we had Joe Clem. Mm-hmm. They were I know, retired. I love Joe Clem. They were both retired from NOAA, but mm-hmm. they lived here and they were great, you know. But we had we had a lot of commercial fishermen and you know, different folks that that chaired the committee and and our at the at the, when we the southern, it was mostly folks from Brunswick County and then Onslow County, you know, mm-hmm. to, to J- Jacksonville Sneeds Ferry. So we had a lot of input from the Sneeds Ferry folks. Mm-hmm coming down coastal pender county in brunswick because there's not as much in new hanover county as there used to be but those counties always were well represented on the committee and it was always within an hour's drive for them Mm -hmm. to come here right and so we always had really good attendance in person at all of our meetings Mm -hmm. um but the district you know i don't i and i don't remember in those days any of the, the moorhead folks have come down because the district, you know, when, when Rich was here, mm-hmm. the, the district manager was here. Mm-hmm. And so the Wilmington staff just ran the meetings yeah. with our committee. So there wasn't, you know, central office staff that had to travel. Right. Now, exactly. I will, Except when they came to give presentations. Right. I will say this. We, so part of the reason that we come is because we run WebEx and I give updates. I try to come anyway, just so I can hear right. comment and I try to give you guys that update. But uh, just, uh, we are actually in the process of getting um, conference setups in all of our offices. Mm-hmm. So once that's finished, 
these will be much easier to set up um, without all of us having to come. So it would be much easier for staff in the area to, to just turn it on and then we'll be there. You right. know? Mm -hmm. So um, that's one thing that, uh, that's one reason that I have sort of felt like we could try to do four meetings a year because right. the technology is there for us to use. So if we can utilize that, then it makes it really doable for us. Yeah. Much more so than before when it always had to be in person. So anyway. Yep, that's great. Okay. Yeah, I think meeting more Generally often possible. is good. You know, okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. And um, if there, so what I'll do is I'll, um, I don't know if anybody online had any comments, and if you do, please speak up. Um, yeah, this is Jason. I will say, I mean, I understand the importance of meeting in person to build relationships with each other, but I do also like the ability to have a hybrid environment in case we aren't physically able to be there, but we're still able to participate. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. that's great. And, and, you know, like I told Pam, we will uh, effectively always have a hybrid environment going forward. That's always the plan at this point. So um, what I will do is uh, we are currently planning for all of the commission meetings and I will put together um, a roughed out schedule for next year for your meeting and you'll get that as an update. So you'll review it and then if you see any conflicts or concerns or anything like that, just let me know. Um, yeah. And I'll be working with the um, staff leads as well to work on that. And just to note, Jeff Harrell, it's no longer on WebEx. Oh, I oh, wonder okay. if he had to drop off. Might have to. Yeah. This is Tom Smith. I do have one question before we get on to all this other stuff. And this is more informational on stuff when we did all the strike bass stuff that's going to, again, come to the um, commission. They said that they were going to be doing a study on the locks and dam you know, ability to get through the fish, the striped bass to get through that. And I would assume that by now they have some data on that. I think that'd be important to share as kind of an update of what did it tell us? Uh huh. Because that's been the, the fear that's been the, the issue for, you know, almost a hundred years or more, I guess. And is is this thing that they built working or not working? And did the flow regime work? Whatever, because that was you know we were, we were speculating when we you know opined on that FMP. So it'd be interesting to know, you know, did something improve or not when it comes to that? Yeah. So, Tom, I can give you a little bit of an update based on what I've heard from. Joe Pachendela, who's one of our biologi biologists here in the Wilmington office and has been working with the partnership um, on that. And so um, from what we've heard so far about all their data is still preliminary from this year, um, they're still working on uh, the, the student who's working on it um, definitely had passage. Um, and so they are looking at um, the level of passage that they had and um, how successful that was. Um, they definitely, so they did have tagged fish that they uh, watched move up the system. Um, they do think that the rock arch is um, successful now. Uh, and the Army Corps did the uh, flood pulses as well. So they are seeing preliminary anecdotal, um, nothing written on the list yet. Um, it seems to be positive. Um, so, but that's, that's that really right now is just uh, back to the napkin stuff. And so um, hopefully in the next couple months, we'll hear more on that as well. Uh, but right now it's sounding good. Well, good, just keep us posted. I think that is a, yeah, you know, that is such a wild card for the Cape Fear. The, if that works, and the pulp, all the things there, so many dynamic things going on there that could improve that fishery. Hopefully, so that'd be very good. Thank you. Yep.
Okay, so um, that's all that I have. Okay. All right. So then we were going to receive some FMP updates from from Corin. Um, just a general management plan implementation update and then a little bit of the scoping overview that maybe Jeff might give us some comments on too. Yeah, well, you'll, you'll hear most from me and then Jeff will come up and try to probably pry some more answers out or mm -hmm. questions out of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, before I jump into what plans we have open, um, I'm going to start with Southern Flounder since I know people would like an update on um, Southern Flounder. So Amendment 3 was adopted in May and the division has implemented management. The 2022 season was based on Amendment 3 management. Uh, the recreational season was opened with a one fish bag limit for the month of September. Um, we will not have full estimates on the recreational season until the MREC wave is released. Um, likely that usually happens at the end of November. Um, so we won't really know how that all shook out until then. The commercial season began on September 15th. Um, there were many DMF staff for this process, fisheries management, licenses and statistics, our protected species uh, people, our marine patrol, that's just a few of the groups that really worked on getting this season um, managed through Amendment 3's uh, scope. So uh, it'll be a few months where we get the data in and start um, having that available to us to tell the story of how this season went. Um, things are starting to um, wrap up for the season um, and uh, but we've heard a lot of positive comments from stakeholders on size and availability of fish and we look forward to having the data so that we could look at the fishery as a total. Um, I know that's not a lot <laughs> but that's what we have right now since um, we're still in it uh, but I wanted to make sure to give that update and um, I could pause if anybody has questions. I wondered too, you know, over, so there's certainly been an indication from the fishing fleet and the rec, both, both recreational and commercial sectors that the availability to, of fish and, the, and large fish has increased. Has the division seen any indications of that in their fishery independent surveys in the last like two to three years? Because the, you know, the flounder harvest has been restricted really going back to 2019, 2020. So this would be the third or fourth year where, where we've had reduced landings um, in the fleet. So I'm just wondering if the divisions started to see any evidence are they are they seeing higher catch rates of flounder, larger average sizes, older fish? Oh, Mike, Mike, Mike I'm going to hand that one to you. I didn't mean to set, I didn't mean to set you up. <laughs> if I'd have known you were here, I wouldn't have asked that. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah. No, that's a great question, and you know, um, the answer is not simple. It's a, it's a mix of of yes and no. Um, and so we are seeing signs um, in our trawl survey that are pretty positive. Um, unfortunately, we didn't see much positive this year because the salinities were so darn high and the fish, you know, when they settled out there were much further up the river systems than where our, our sampling sites typically occur. Um, but with that said, we've done some additional sampling to connect, collect genetic samples and there were a very large volume of juvenile southern flounder captured in that, um, particularly in the northern part of the state, up at Albemarle Sound and Currituck Sound. Um, so that's really good news. Um, you're spot on. We're seeing bigger fish across the board. Um, our 915 gillnet survey um, has seen some pretty significant changes this year. We saw a couple of days that were really good last year. Um, we're seeing good sized fish um, throughout the calendar year. Um, which is a positive thing where in the past we saw, you know, small fish early in the year. We watched those grow 
Um, but the last couple of years, we've seen large fish early in the spring, which is really positive. Um, we're just starting to work on age data for our 2021 samples. Um, and there's indications that we're seeing a few more three-year-olds. And I believe we've actually seen one seven-year-old so far in our 2021 sampling, which is really exciting because we haven't seen a fish greater than age five in a number of years. So there's a lot of positive signs going on with the, the Southern founder stock for sure. Good. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. <laughs> Anything else on flounder before I move on? Okay. So um, I'm going to start uh, the rest of this with our um, 2022 to 2027 FMP schedule. So annually, uh, we um, build a five-year schedule that the DEQ secretary approves, and this gives us what um, FMPs we will open up and be working on. So at the uh, August commission meeting, we updated the commission on our schedule, and the DEQ secretary approved that schedule. And so the 2022-2023 species that we are reviewing are river herring, hard clam and oyster, estuarine striped bass, spotted sea trout, and striped mullet. Um, additionally, in 2023, the division plans to update the blue crab stock assessment as laid out in Amendment 3, Adaptive Management. So, I'll start with the blue crab. Um, that stock assessment will include data through 2022, and it's a stock assessment update um, based on the 26, the, based on the previous benchmark assessment, which terminal year was 2016. And that had indicated that the stock was overfished and overfishing was incur occurring. Um, so we took action under Amendment 3 to the Blue Crab FMP. This stock assessment will add six years of data. Um, depending on the management from Amendment 3, it'll be two or three years worth of management data that will be included in that um, where we were addressing that stock status. Um, Another item that the division is currently reviewing is the list of approved diamondback terrapin birds um, in our diamondback terrapin management areas, um, which you all in this region are likely more familiar with since they are in this area. Um, you are, um, it is mandatory for several months out of the year to use a diamondback terrapin excluder. So, um, the division um, and um, partnered with UNCW in 2021 um, to look at a modified funnel design that was proposed by North Carolina crabbers as a option to add to the approved list. So now we have um, some research to go on with that and the division is reviewing the results of that and um, the shellfish crustacean AC um, is part of the review system for approving new um, excluder devices. And therefore, um, they will likely hear about that in early 2023. And if they hear about it, we'll probably update all of you as well. <laughs> we won't hide it from you. Um, so that is... Um, what is happening with blue crab. So I'll return to our schedule. And as Laura said, uh, no management changes were deemed necessary for river herring. Um, so the plan opened and was completed, the five-year review on the same day. Um, and we used the 2022 annual FMP um, review as a information update. Um, hard clam and oyster plan, um, we are currently um, undergoing a review of the available data and current management that is in place. And um, so we will be reviewing that over the next um, few months and um, likely 
we will have um, more to bring to um, everyone in late 2023, um, with likely um, that being when a scoping uh, period would begin. So next, um, I have estrin striped bass. So the advisory committee gave recommendations for amendment two in March, and um, Laura covered um, pretty much what's been going on with the Marine Fisheries Commission since then, and they'll be reviewing again at their November business meeting. In the meantime, um, after continued stock concerns based on a low juvenile abundance in the annual review, the division undertook a stock assessment update in the for the Abmoral Roanoke stocks. Um, the division and WRC staff continue to work on this update. Due to the initial review of the assessment results, the director did not open the fall season in the Abmoral Sound and continues to assess that subject. So I'm going to pause right there in case anybody had any questions on those items. Give myself a breather. <laughs> I just had a question. Is the schedule, like the, the 22 to 27 FMP schedule that you said was approved, is that on the, the fishery management plan portion of the website? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and that, we set it for the five years, mm -hmm. and that's kind of like, Best, well, the current plan, right? But we do that annually. Yeah. So as we do the, um, so every July we do um, our annual um, update of all review of all of our stock or not stock assessments, whew, our FMPs, and that includes uh, both our state and federal ones that we're involved with. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty extensive book. And all of that is available on our website um, under the individual FMPs. And um, we use that to look at and assess what's going on when we're doing our five-year schedule. Mm -hmm. um, so if we see something that is concerning, then we'll shift things around a little bit. Um, and in recent years, we had that big buildup of all of our plans that were overlapping. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at it right now, you're going to see in 2024, it says the only thing opening is uh, or going on is red drum. Mm -hmm. Obviously, something else will be put in there. It'll right. just be that right now we're assessing what needs to shift into there and everything. So okay. it's kind of a review annually, see how that five year schedule needs to go. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Moving on to audit sea trout. So we had a peer, peer review panel um, which agreed that the spotted sea trout stock assessment is the best available science and is appropriate to base management on. The assessment contains data through 2019, and it has estimates that the stock is not overfished um, with the biomass above the target. However, it is experiencing overfishing. So um, a stock assessment overview will be presented to the commission at its November meeting. And then um, in early 2023, we will um, bring scoping to the public as we did with mullet and um, start working on a amendment for that plan. Um, any questions on spotted sea trout? So when you were talking about uh, you, you have been peer reviewed and the methods that you were using were deemed to be available to base management. So when uh, who who are the peers? That's what I want to know. Is it just within the state? Is it a national so, peer review board? Or that's a good question. Um, so we reach out to people um, who are familiar with the species and/or with the stock assessment method. 
that we are using when we are doing these peer reviews. The spotted sea trout peer review panel, we had um, one person from North Carolina, uh, we had one person from Florida, and we had one person from Texas that okay. reviewed that plan. And it's always and, outside the division. Yes, and it's always outside okay. the division, um, third party sources that are um, experts in their field and know that process. I understand. <laughs> I got you. So the the this this method that you deem usable is that the same construct that you used in the previous assessment for speckled trout? No, no, it no, is not. Um, we updated this assessment to. Um, oh boy. So the, I, I can, you. yeah, I can go to that one. So um, the previous assessment did not include any consideration for cold stuns. Thank you. Jack. Um, and so the, the previous assessment in the reviewers, um, they do a report where they basically talk about what they think is good, what they think is bad, and is it appropriate? And the last model, they said, you really need to consider the cold stun impact on this population because as I think all of you know, a cold sun of straight of spotted sea trout can be pretty devastating to the population. They recover very well, but you have to take that into consideration. So this model, um, this is one that um, Yan, who is one of our stock assessment scientists, has worked on to include um, that sort of environmental factor. So they've um, Hopefully you'll be able to listen to her presentation because she will explain it much better than I will, but um, it has taken in, into account those cold stuns um, and so the um, impact on the fishery mm -hmm. from those. Yeah. Okay. Thank well, you. My good. brain just shut off. <laughs> <laughs> You're going up. said loud <laughs> And Fred and others, the stock assessment is posted online too, and yeah. just posted last week. So yeah. if you're interested, you can delve into it further that way, uh, yeah. or reach out to staff. We can send it to you. And that was that was based on research that was actually done here in North Carolina by mm -hmm. that uh, in Jeff Buckle's group with Tim Ellis, and they did um, conventional tagging and acoustic tagging. And some laboratory experiments to look at cold, cold tolerance, mm -hmm. and um, found that when the when those winter kills occurred, that the natural mortality rate far exceeded the harvest rate you know, right. during those years, and it aligned really well with the long-term fishery independent data that the division had. So you right. could see the signal of that in their data as well, which was really nice way to validate it. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's so, certainly dollars as to yeah to be. So they can see when the a great, a greater impact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it is also showing how quickly they come back. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Can. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You can see those signals where it's like, oh, there that had to be a cold sun here. And right. next year you're like, oh, goodness. Yeah. yeah. As you said at our meeting, they repopulate. They breed yeah. like mosquitoes. They do. <laughs> they do speckle trout. Mm -hmm. But anyway, but thank you for answering my okay. question. I appreciate it. Okay, so um, last but not least for my updates is our striped mullet. The striped mullet stock assessment was presented to the commission at its May business meeting. The peer review assessment indicated that the stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring in the terminal year of 2019. Um, because the stock concern, um, the DEQ secretary has determined it is in the long-term interest of the stock to develop temporary management through a supplement. And the secretary has asked the Marine Fisheries Commission to work with the division on developing and implementing a supplement. Uh, the supplement will be in place until Amendment 2 is adopted. Um, the supplement will be presented to the commission at its November meeting. Also at the November meeting, the commission will be asked to approve the goal and objectives for amendment two. 
and to review the public scoping period, which was held from September 26th through October 7th. The scoping document was developed by staff to guide conversation during this period and seek input on management strategies to be developed during the amendment to drafting. Management strategies are techniques that achieve the goal and objectives of the plan. Um, the proposed management strategies for Amendment 2 include um, sustainable harvest, recreational fishery management, small mesh gill net management, stop net fisheries management, um, and migration corridors. The division reached out to stakeholders through an online questionnaire and three in-person meetings one of which was held hybrid as a online and in-person meeting. Um, this was our first hybrid meeting um, of that forum type meeting. Um, and so um, I appreciated all of the feedback stakeholders gave on some of the um, technical difficulties of hearing some of the people um, because it was a very casual conversation meeting um, where we just had speakers around the room. So um, I'll be working on troubleshooting a little bit of that before our next scoping. Um, but anytime that the public um, has feedback on that, um, Laura and I appreciate it because we really are trying to make this um, and ourselves as accessible as possible to our diverse stakeholder group. Um, so over 200 stakeholders participated throughout that two weeks. Uh, comments centered on concerns over the assessment results, regional management, year specific management, year round fishing needs, recreational fisheries, and concern over um, overfishing of certain life stages. Um, in the Wilmington area, we heard a lot about concerns on uh, finger mullet. Um, so there was a lot of interest um, from stakeholders to be members of our fisheries management plan advisory committee. And this committee works directly with the division to draft the plan. Um, and we look forward to speaking with those people who um, gave me their uh, email address or phone number along the way. Um, and as we move forward, I'll be getting in touch with a lot of them, well, all of them, to see if they're still interested in participating in the process. Um, so that's pretty much my update for that. Um, Beth can come up and hang out with us, yeah. and uh, we can talk about it. <laughs> so I did uh, want to note one more thing for the takeaways from the scoping, is the uh, public seemed very interested in adaptive management. Mm -hmm. Um, we heard a lot, you know, once we put in regulations, they never go away. So we'd like to build into the plan this time uh, a mechanism for if the population is looking better to allow more harvest. But um, other than that, Corinne covered it very well. So does anybody have, um, first we'll go with questions. Any questions about anything that I had in that part of the update? So in the, so the can you talk a little bit more about the development of the supplement and whether that you know you were saying that's going to be presented to the commission in November mm -hmm. so that sort of implies they didn't have any input into it or did they have input into it throughout its development so the How way a work supplement process works is um, we the division um developed the supplement the management that um, could go in place um, and that management is um, temporary until new management is put into place um, and it needs to be um, simple yet effective um, so we um, with this supplement have um, basically looked at um, seasonal closures um, for the end of the year um, to address the um, overfishing aspect of um, the stock um, and um, ending that within one year. 
Um, so the um, commission will get that in November, um, review it. There's some options in there for them. Um, and when they review it, if they like what they see, um, they can um, pick what the management that they're um, looking for, um, and then it would go out for public comment. And then uh, um, at their February meeting um, would be when they would put that into place, and it would be implemented then um, in 2023. Um, the other possibility is that they hate it and send us back to the drawing board. <laughs> Okay. So it would be 2023, mm -hmm. nothing in 2022. Correct. Yes. And then the, the scope, they're going to get some scoping information from you guys. And then, and then you said they're going to maybe vote on some preferred goals. management strategy or just goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. Okay. The yeah. The only vote, vote is goal and objective when it comes to amendment um, two. Okay. Um, but then they will have the opportunity to discuss those management for the long-term management right. um, for the amendment process. And then you guys will then, the PDT will develop amendment to. Mm -hmm. Based on input from the Marine Fisheries Commission on. Right. Yeah. On those goals, objectives mm -hmm. and. And everything that we heard during the scoping period, which we had some great insight throughout that um, of um, concerns, how people fish, the gear that they use, and, and things like that. So there's a lot for us to start um, milling over. Okay. And then maybe the hope is the hope that the FMP Amendment 2 would be potentially in place for 2024. Supplement would be 2023, and then Amendment 2024, or maybe supplement for two years and Amendment in 25. So right now, if everything would go completely as scheduled, the first time the commission would see a draft plan would be August of 2023. Okay. Um, that would be for AC and public review. And that would be for AC and public review. So then that would be the October that you all get to see it, give input on it. Um, and then that process goes to the commission choosing uh, preferred management at November. Okay. Um, then that goes to the 90 days for, or, or 60 days for um, Raleigh to look at it. Um, okay. And then so the, the earliest it could happen would be February of 2024. Okay. And do you guys have, is there a, a species specific AC will there be for striped muller? Yes. Okay, but that hasn't been formed yet. No, we will. Um, so I, I took a whole bunch of phone numbers and emails during yeah. the scoping process, and um, we will put out a press release when we are ready to um, get people together for that. The reason we like to wait on that is so that we have a better idea of a time frame of when that happens, since right. now we, instead of doing those long AC meet once a month at nauseam for like a year. Um, now it is a shortened, condensed, um, casual meeting between the whole PDT and the advisory committee over a couple of days and we hash it all out all at once. Okay. Um, so when we have a better idea of when we are ready for that, usually it's about two months before we're ready to go to a workshop. Um, we put out a press release, leave it open for a few weeks for um, people to apply. And at that point, I'll start, or leads will start calling people that has shown interest. And um, the same way that we take applications for these committees, um, the chair of the MFP selects who is on those um, FMP advisory committees as well. And then when the chair decides that, get everybody together. Cool. So I'm really interested to hear from y'all over here if you have any ideas for uh, the, the amendment that's coming, if you had any management suggestions, concerns, or questions for me. I do, of course. Because <laughs> um, I went to that scoping meeting um, in Moorhead. 
So there was a lot of concern at that meeting about the about the stock assessment itself and that the benchmark had been moved for you know whatever the biological benchmark had been moved so that the data was not viewed in the same manner as it was in 2019 or 2017 when that assessment said no problem at all and so there was no problem then but now this benchmark is being moved there's a whole nother you know process that has been developed around this and i would like to know were these concerns have you guys yeah. considered this and also just like with speckled trout and the goldstone thing mm -hmm. you know it was pointed out certain benchmarks where it looked like the stock was going down really there was hurricane isabel in 2004 there were you know all every single one coincided with the storm event and i do want to note that there was a uh, a little bit of a miscommunication during that meeting the benchmark didn't change the spr was changed for the target but not for the threshold so that wouldn't affect the overfishing or overfish status um and the previous there we've used the same model but we changed the inputs the previous model um, was deemed fit for management but it wasn't able to look at the overfish status it was a little bit limited um, so this one we actually felt more comfortable with the the, the first there was no overfish status there was none right we couldn't right. assess that exactly the overfishing status could be assessed um, this one uh, we were able to assess that because it was a little more comprehensive, a little more informative, and the the model was more stable. Well, it it very much appears very similar to flounder, where there was nothing, but now we tweaked and changed and almost conjured up a problem. So where I, it was clearly stated there was none. And I, I will say that the previous assessment showed that we were right on that edge of overfishing. And so it's not uncommon between assessments um, because the terminal year has such an effect on the model for you to get some slight changes in this in what you had previously seen for a given year. Um, so in, in, so and so you're going just to real quick on that. I will note that in this one, instead of using the terminal year, we are using a Another that's spotted sea trout. That's all right. Keep confusing the two. And so, <laughs> it, and we're going to note more about these environmental input on the the stock, so that it doesn't appear that you know it's all due. I mean, the commercial fishermen, and I can't speak for anybody else. That's all I know. But it's very much perceived that the commercial fishermen is taken and and they are really taking all of the brunt of all these fisheries <laughs> yeah we lost the audio A lot of this it feels that way. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It's Overfishing sites like you fish on the run. Hold on one second. We were the audio sucked. <laughs> Sorry. Let's see if I can remember that saying. We okay, so you say it way a lot. You say it and then repeat it. Yeah, yeah. like I can hear a word of it. Yeah. Like, oh, I'll hold the audio. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> I'll go back. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs>
No audio that we can hear. I can hear out here. You can still hear me, though, Tom, can't you? This is Jason. Yeah, I can hear you, Jason. Okay. Yeah, their audio is out right now. It's trying to connect, they said. Yeah, click on that. Now, at least I can. Now we're starting to hear some, yes. That quit. It just quit again. Well, <laughs> I think we're having technological failure here. Yeah, just a little bit. Oh, yeah, well, there a, yeah, it's good now. Okay, well, you turn up sport fishermen use them for bait. bait. Okay, bait. they're going deep sea fishing, they'll eat cut them for bait, right. but at home, okay. people eat them just like right. every other fish. But Tom, are you back? I wonder what the rest of the commercial. Yeah, I'm here. I can it's hear y'all. We just needed something. one of you to yeah. talk. <laughs> and they talked and I turned up the volume. Okay. So, so I, I we're did, back. Yeah, okay. I did want to address the the comment that you know it it seems like we're blaming the commercial fishermen here, and terms like overfished make it sound like someone did it. But you can have an overfished stock for reasons of natural mortality. Um, right. In this case, it could be driven by habitat loss, water quality issues. This is not pinning it on anyone. We're not trying to play a blame game. This is just the stock is not a good position whether or not it has to do with fishing or not and because the stock biomass is low it's not a lot for it to be for overfishing to be occurring so it's not even though we're fishing at a similar rate or even lower than we have historically the stock just can't support it anymore because of habitat loss or water quality or unknown i can't even speak to what it is we don't we don't know we've started having some discussion you know, let me have, make one comment there. I remember when we approved this one, whatever, however many years ago it was, and I do remember that the assessment said we were right on the edge, as you mentioned earlier, and they set the guidelines for the harvest right to the edge. You know, it was up to the maximum, and it's not surprising that if you do that and you have no room for error for any other 
factors, environmental, habitat, or whatever, that you end up tipping over. You know, it, there was no margin in the, in the last FMP for anything to go wrong. And that's a great point. We we don't really have an accurate juvenile abundance index for this. So it's pretty hard to get a sense of recruitment. And what it really took was we went from a higher recruitment level throughout the 90s to like a middle recruitment level in the early 2000s. And then it really dropped off in 2015. And we've been in this extended low recruitment period where we're just not getting enough fish recruiting to this fishery. So it can't really support as much fishing. And we had continued on this higher level of fishing with the lower level of recruitment. And that's where we got into trouble. And where we think we need to change now. That's the management that we're talking about at this point. Yep. We were, well, you know, we were talking about was the, the biological reference points and the management reference points and, and using the terms overfishing, right, and overfished. And like you said, it implies that the, you know, and, and what it, what's happening in reality when we're overfishing is just the, the mortality rate's too high. And it could be that M is really high, but, you know, well, the only thing we can control is F, right? And, and the same with the overfish status, right? We should just say that the biomass is below the threshold. Right. And that, that was a lot of the bones of contention because right. you can't control right. hurricanes like 2019, what was that, Florence? You know, you can't control overdevelopment that's rampant. You've got the, the uh, chip, but there's no teeth there. It doesn't do anything. You can't control that. Mm -hmm. And then the recreational fisher, fishery is not really existent for mullets anyway. They've got these poor souls out there trying to catch bait, you know. Right. Uh, and, and the central region is the main people doing it. And it just seems like, you know, we should take in, and, and I'm sure they are now. It, it just did not appear that way on the graphs and the graphic cues on screen. It it did not those those markers, especially hurricanes, that are so disruptive to everything. That was four years ago, Hurricane Florence. Mm -hmm. And that is not clearly shown on the graphics when people when laymen are looking at these things. It's very confusing. Mm -hmm. And the only people that are going to really carry the brunt of all this as usual is the commercial fishermen because that's all you can control you're not making any more fish mm -hmm. <laughs> that's beyond all of us and we can pat ourselves on the back and, and make us think that we are but we're not we can't we can't do that because we could have another hurricane next year to be equally as devastating and so I think it's important. I, I think that's important to point out when Absolutely. you're giving these presentations. And as the Division of Marine Fisheries, you know, we're tasked with management. And the only thing that we can control is what people can fish. For. Exactly. We don't have control over water quality. We don't. We can't tell people not to build houses on the coast. Yep. And I appreciate the comments that you just made of our failing to convey that during that meeting because then that helps us as we're moving forward. It has been the, the director and the section chief um, really are working on this transparency of the division. And so um, we really are trying to bring the science to everyone so that it's at a digestible level. And as you know, that's difficult. And yeah, we miss the yeah. mark sometimes. And we um, we really appreciate when people point that out so that we can um, adjust and tweak things moving forward. <laughs> well, that that's going to be one of the benefits of these scoping meetings. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you're you're out there scoping, you gauge what the reactions are mm -hmm. and adjust. Yeah, and I really so. think that this, you know, this has been this is our first scoping in person. Really, right? Yeah, yeah first scoping in person. So um, I was very happy with our turnout, um, with the participation we've had. The federal councils and ASMSC have been doing scoping for years now. And um, so when we really looked at the FMP process, we were like, we, we need to do this. We need to get the stakeholders involved from the beginning. 
Um, so as we move forward with this, I'm, I'm really trying to embrace that and find more ways um, to have these casual conversations um, and, and really get to the heart of it. So um, I appreciate those comments of how to improve things as we move forward um, and really do hope that everybody continues to be as active with it. So on that point, I would like to uh, say the reason we're really here is to get some input from y'all on what you think um, would be appropriate management measures moving forward to try to reduce harvest and, a chain, and attain a, a sustainable harvest, you know, reduce end overfishing and end the overfish status. What, to what extent, what do, you, what do you think that you're looking at in terms of harvest reductions, just ballpark? Um, so in order to just to just to get under the overfishing threshold. Yep, to hit the threshold, it's nine percent, um, okay. and to get to the target, it's twenty to thirty-three percent. Okay, so ten ten to thirty somewhere in that neighborhood is what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious. You know, Corinne had listed a few um, main like issues that we had thought of for addressing this, but we're also interested if you have ideas outside of that we can go back over the the general groupings we had if you want um sure sustainable harvest uh small mesh gill net stop net fishery recreational harvest and migration corridors i believe they're all five mm -hmm. um you have looked at your documents <laughs> <laughs> for the supplemental you guys are looking potentially at sort of maybe seasonal closures toward the end of the year, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it would it would be next year, not this year. But you don't view that as a potential long-term strategy. It's not that we don't. And I'll let Jeff go into that. Yeah. So um, the supplement is sort of a stopgap measure right. here. So we're looking for something that can be easily instituted. You know, quota takes a lot of effort. Right. We can't change rules in right. a year. We need to go through a rulemaking process. So we need something that we can easily institute and not have. We we looked at several options, but we're worried about recruitment if you have trip limits or you have a, a mid-season mid -season closure. So we've pretty well narrowed in on this end of year closure so that there's not recruitment afterwards. Right. We're allowing some escapement and we can end the overfishing that year mm -hmm. immediately, basically. And just to um, Tom, your point, uh, we are looking at that higher reduction level, so the 20 to 30 percent, uh, to be more conservative uh, and to be on that end. Um, in sort of a balance to that, for the amendment, uh, the adaptive management is really um, a big sort of focus for us because we do think that striped mullet have the potential to recover quickly um, and that we could, you know, following a, a conservative reduction, there's more potential for that fishery to then be reopened or... Um, it, and I do want to state that we heard repeatedly that we don't want to base adaptive management on landings because hurricanes, right. uh, market, fluctuations if we don't have a cutter yeah. you're not going to have the same kind of harvest so this would be more uh you know possibly abundance index um stock assessment something along those lines but i think that is the prudent thing to do yeah not using we've heard it and we <laughs> we heard you and we've noted it we no landings no landings. <laughs> i i mean I, I like that idea i just tom you're if you're talking you're muted I thought I'd unmuted myself, but I guess ultimately we we have to look at what is the simplest, easiest way to ensure that enough fish get to spawn so we can have the juveniles for the next season. And, and yep. which, which way will do that? Because it seems like this is a recruitment issue, which means too many of the adult fish are getting caught right before the spawn. That's what it appears to be, whether that's right or wrong. But you somehow you have to increase increase the recruitment. And the only way I know it's a big targeted fishery, 
you know, for the row model. And that's where the value is in them. But somewhere you have to say we have to have enough escapement to ensure a good population, you know, coming on. And that's really my question back to y'all. Do y'all see the way to do that? I mean, we yep, can all so, speculate, but that's the that is the ultimate issue here. Yeah, and and that, like Jeff said, the focus is on an end of year closure that would this is for the supplement for the supplement yes um and, and for the supplement this would be immediate um not immediate but it would be sort of the fastest implementing uh management would be a season closure um the row mullet fishery occurs there's over 50 percent of the fish are caught in From october, october 15th to november 15th yeah so october it's a 15th. very consolidated fishery and that is the reduction the reductions um uh, will need to come from that season but again so, again that <laughs> that one month that 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 one month where people make their money that one month there's there's a whole nother 11 months out of the year where yeah. They're still out there. They're still having little finger mullets. And it's not unlike the speckled trout, as I've already said, situation. And if you have a hurricane, that is going to further depress whatever you're catching. This is not all fishery that is declined. It absolutely not, in my view, that has declined because of this big harvest of road mullets. I mean, it's just not there and hasn't been there for many, many years. And and it, it's just, in a way, just crazy to think that we're going to say, oh, there's this great big take of mullets in this one month period of time. I mean, that's nuts. So we're not saying that it's in a historical perspective that people are taking a lot of mullets in the most recent years. We're just saying if you look at a calendar of when the harvest occurs, most of the harvest occurs October 15th. Of course, but there's still plenty of 11 other months where recruitment is occurring, not just during this one month. The, so the spawning period is after they migrate to the ocean, obviously. So all we're trying to do is uh, protect some of these females so that they can make it out to the ocean to spawn. If we if we have the closure earlier in the year, um, you have this closure, none of these fish are getting caught, you have a higher abundance in whatever areas are closed, and then immediately after that, the fish become more available to catch, and you can recoup those losses later in the year when they make their migration to the ocean. They pretty much all have to go out of one of five inlets yeah, but that, that can't, that cannot, that, yeah. that absolutely can't, can't be. So, and, and I just want to be clear that the division has not thought of any management beyond the supplement. We have not put pen to paper yet. We have not really even got together as a PDT to hash out big out of the box kind of thoughts or anything like that for the amendment. And I believe that's what Tom's talking about is the amendment. And so we have not, besides this supplement and that end of the year management, which is in that supplement, we, the world is our oyster right now. Yeah. Um, because we have not even thought about management at that level yet. So that's something that we'll do over the next six months internally um, and really start thinking of exactly what you're saying. Um, how do we increase our you know, spawning potential, how do we increase our juvenile abundance, um, you know, all of that. How do we end the overfishing and, and the overfish status? And I want to say I was, I don't know if people assumed I was speaking on the amendment. I was speaking to the to the supplement. Yeah, and that's where I thought we were getting kind of yeah, confused we, on where apples and, and oranges. And while I'm, I, I, I'm happy to share that information and, and inform you all, the focus for tonight, I would like to hear input for the amendment on what your ideas are for management to re reduce harvest and rebuild the stock, uh, looking past the supplement towards 2024. The supplement is a stopgap 
Um, it's going to be just probably for a year, optimally, maybe two if things get delayed. Right. But beyond that, um, if you have any ideas in terms of adaptive management, uh, migration corridors, anything that we've discussed or anything outside of what we've already discussed, if you have any ideas, we'd love to hear it. Um, we're going to bring this to the Marine Fisheries Commission. Well, I think I think you're going to have to get out and make more contact with these commercial fishermen. Not necessarily that, I mean, I don't even think there's anybody on this committee that can even speak to that at all. That it should be done by people who are directly affected, not people, well, we want to pat themselves on the back because it might save something. I think it needs to be the commercial man that makes these recommendations. And I do want to say that was the purpose of scoping and having public comment. And we did get some great comments. I know the meetings seem to go a little off the rails in terms of um, you know circular conversations and a little bit of just frustration being shown. But we did get some good feedback. We heard that adaptive management needs to be involved. We heard that regional differences are important to account for in management. We can't, it's not a one size fits all. We heard that row mullet aren't the only important mullet, bait mullet and food mullet are important and they're important in different proportions if you're talking about Northern, Pamlico, Central mm -hmm. and Southern areas. Down here, they're, the meat market is what's important. Up North, the bait market in the Central area. Central area, area meat. Meat, meat, or, <laughs> yeah. row, and then bait last. So I think we do have some good takeaways. Um, maybe not necessarily direct management strategies, but we have things to think about within these management strategies. Because they are the ones that are going to be getting managed. Yeah, what's the what's the, what's the max age of, of striped mullet that we that we know? I'm just thinking can, about like if they're the max age recorded was in the teens. I can't speak to the exact, but the max age for our model was seven plus. Seven plus, okay. And we don't see the the fishery and in the independent studies we have, it's just completely dominated by age two fish. Mostly twos. Yeah, yeah we have seen an age truncation, a significant age truncation um, in the past 15 years. Okay. We're down to 90% of the fisheries age two fish. Okay. Uh, one or two. <laughs> one or two. Yeah. I mean, they're just, but they're just like, yeah, they're just the like, best. and it's That's difficult. Well, how, out, I mean, mean. How, how adaptive do you guys think you can be? You know, when you say adaptive management, you know, with the species like this, with the life history strategy they have, you know, it seems like we need to make changes maybe you know, every couple of years, potentially, right? Even possibly, even, you know, even sooner. Yeah, right? short-lived species like this, if you're talking right. about a generational time period of two years, yeah, may, at most three, four years. Right. Um, yeah, I would think it's probably not something where we want to base it on a stock assessment. Right. But um, there's a lot of options that we could use. Right. I think, in my mind, what pops out would be, you know, an abundance index, what right. we use for our yearly FMP updates, looking at the uh, the survey that was used in the SOC assessment, the GILNET survey, and we could even expand that to areas that weren't included in the in the stock assessment because they right. didn't have enough years of data, but we've expanded to the central area, the fourth sound, the mm -hmm. sound, um, and we didn't really use- that's what they talked about. Yeah, we, yeah. we didn't really use the, um, we didn't use the Cape Fear, but I think they're starting to figure it out a little more. We had some issues with um, abundance disease in, in the Cape Fear. So the Cape Fear really doesn't have a lot of mullet in it, does it? Are they, there, are they mostly in the southern ocean? Part, so in the southern part of the river, yeah, the lower river. A little bit you see downtown. Sometimes. So you're thinking maybe some, some, like something similar to like a traffic light approach using the abundance index as a trigger? I mean, I'm, I'm, those are just ideas. I'm not right. thinking anything in particular, but um, those were just throwing out right. possibilities uh, for adaptive management because we have heard so much that we need the ability to relax or constrict uh, management yeah. at, in, a, in following what the populations do. Yeah, no, you, I mean, you could also, you might consider sort of the fraction 
the fractional contribution of some of those older age groups as another trigger, right? You know, so when you start seeing some threes and fours and fives in the survey data within the next couple of years, potentially, that would be a, another sign of, um, because they're hard. You can't. You don't have a juvenile index, right? I mean, right. Just, they're really hard to deal with when they're that small. And so. and I will say, you know, we had that electrofishing survey in the previous model, but really it was limited to some very small areas on the News River where we were already covering that with the gillnet survey. Well, now we're expanding that survey um, down here um, in the rivers. Right. And in the central area, White Oak River, right. some some areas where we can shock. Obviously, core sounds a little too salty. Yeah. But um, with the expansion of that, the rivers uh, in the bays. I mean, there's yeah. and we Fuku's mullets up there. And right now, um, we have expanded into like South River, the the, mm -hmm. the lower salinity portions of the South River. And I think that's really going to help inform us more than having these like two stations in Slocum and Hancock Creek. Right. That's so. That's something we can use. We can continue uh, to use the gillnet survey. We could use a blended index. Well, I think that that expanded will be to everybody's benefit because it seems like sampling is so small. It's it's so ineffective. You know, it's not giving you a true idea of what's out. And we we heard that um, some throughout the scoping that folks were concerned with the sampling methodology and it is hard um to to grasp how us only catching you know three mullets per set could possibly inform us on anything but if you're looking at long-term true trends you know we're not going out it, obviously if you set a net around a school mullet you're going to catch it if you set a 30 yard piece of gill net perpendicular to shore not going to catch that many. But if you're consistently doing it the same way over and over for months and years, you can look at trends and understand which direction they're going. And, and that index really does track well with the landings and also with what we know about recruitment. And we can see those major events where 2015, there was a big drop, big decline in harvest. We saw that in the population a big drop um in years with hurricanes we don't really see them as much in the in the surveys after the hurricanes so we're picking it up i think i'm confident in the survey um it's just that we're not seeing them in the volume that fishermen see so it's kind of hard to believe i can understand that it's hard to to grasp that with three four bullets. i i don't think you can make any kind of accessible three bullets <laughs> i mean i just don't no wonder you think they're Declining. How should they migrate state to state, even within the state? That's a great question. So, um, in '99 to 2002, the state conducted a tagging survey. We tagged over 14,000 mullet throughout the state, all the way from uh, Currituck and Albemarle Sounds down here to the Cape Fear River, even I think even further towards the South Carolina border. We recaptured uh, over around 400 fish, I believe, in that four or five year period. And we only three were recaptured outside the state, two in South Carolina and one in Virginia. But even within the state movement, we didn't really see a whole lot moving from the northern part of the state into the southern. They were recaptured, I think average, it was like their range was like 30 kilometers or something. It was so not very long. Even if they got to spawn from what we can see, because we did have returns years later, which means that these fish have moved out to spawn we're not you know we're we're not aware of any skip spawning behavior with these so we're pretty sure that these females go out and spawn and they come back and right. we see we've had recaptures multiple years later right. in a similar area maybe 30 40 kilometers. do you see differences across the state and how abundant they are then with or you said you've only had two places where you're checking them right now right or uh for north to south like do you see differences? Are you talking about the tagging study or more about just the abundance of fish? More the abundance of the fish with the, you know, if we've got areas, I don't know if there's areas of the state where there's more more being taken than others, and do you see differences from that? So an interesting life history detail on mullet is they spend a lot of their young lives up in really low salinity waters, yeah. the tops of the rivers, Pamlico, Noose Rivers, up in Elmar Sound, Lower Salinity. And you're, and you're talking this size? Yep, the little top, little, tiny, the tops of the creeks, like in the black bit. water. Yeah. Okay. And as they grow, they tend to move out into saltier waters, and then they make a migration from it could be the top of the Noose River 
all the way out to the ocean to migrate. So it's really um, seasonally dependent and size dependent where and, and what you're seeing. So those age zero fish, meaning the first year of life, they tend they get uh, pushed in by offshore currents and then they kind of go to safe habitats, tops of creeks, uh, grassy seagrass areas, and then they they eat uh, plankton and grow, and then they start to migrate out. So you'll see those finger-sized mullet getting into summer. They start getting to a size where people might be able to exploit them for bait. Um, and then later in the year, those larger mullet will come out of the creeks, and you'll, you can see that migration in our data, and you can see it in the catches. And But you don't see a difference in location from where – you talk about they don't – they don't migrate across the state much. So if it was all fishing pressure, would you see areas if there were more fishing that, that, that there would be less fish? Or we don't see that? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm... He's talking like regionally. Yeah, like regionally. If you look at just the part of the population from Abmar, or like around there, or okay. just the central yeah. area. Yeah, yeah. If you have a lot of fishing in the Albemarle Sound, do you see less fish there? Yeah. Over time, I, um, I don't think this is something we've really looked at. <laughs> that's a good, that's that's a good question. question. That would kind of indicate that's that was a question. Um, an issue. Right now. So the the harvest does track with the abundance that we see. Now, granted, this the harvest is overall state. We're looking at trip tickets from the entire state, and the survey we're looking at an average of these parts of the Hyde County Sound the Newts and Pamlico rivers, and then the New River. Um, the study in the central area in Vogue Sound and Core Sound is too new. We didn't have enough years to to use that survey. Um, so we went to 2008. We, we That was our first uh, year of survey input because that's when the New River was added. Right. So 2008 to 2019 is the independent survey years. Um, and that covers, like I said, New, Newts, Pamlico, and parts of Hyde County. So we're looking at a pretty good swath of the state inshore waters, and then the trip tickets cover the entire state. So when we see a, a drop or a peak in abundance, we typically, that correlates to- We're not looking at landings. We're not, the landings were not used for the abundance. The landings were only used to estimate removals from the fish. Fred, I just- Where do you see it? Um, yeah. Paint bear cloth came on. Oh, okay. okay. Sure. And those removals are based on the economics of the thing. Yes, and but in in years where the market is good, um, it tracks pretty well with the abundance. Yeah. Now, if you have a strange year like 2020 when COVID restricted the market, we actually don't have any survey data because we couldn't go on the water either. So that's <laughs> just a black hole right now. That's why we extend the terminal year into 2020 because all we had was the removals, but they were affected by the market, and we didn't have any survey data. Do we have, um, just I'm looking at the time, because we're getting close to 8 o'clock, and we haven't done public comments, but I know we don't have anyone from the public here it's been on the WebEx that wanted to make public comment. No, because uh, we only are broadcasting on YouTube, so okay. there's no way for public to give comment on there. Okay. It's only in person. In person, yep. public comment, okay. Um, so I'm interested on your take. Um, you're saying you you think the fishermen need to have as much say as possible in this. Yes, I do. Um, I do because they're they're basically the only ones that seem to be affected. Have Have you? I heard, wouldn't even talk to anybody else. Have you uh, Have you heard from anyone that fishes mullet a lot on what they're? I know obviously they're. I the have. Main is that they don't like. <laughs> I have. We've heard they, that. We've, they. But. Yes, I, I have heard from a number of people that do mullet speech thing, which they're doing prosecuting that fishery right now in Salter Pie. And, and it's just, it, you know, the perception is that this is one of, this is the perception and it, that, but this is one of the last fisheries that you can go out there, you can make some money at. And it's not. It's largely it, unregulated. It's, it's well. It's yes. In a word, yes. 
and but it's it's regulated by its own self its own self because nobody the fat mullets the big <laughs> mullets are now and that's when you catch them it's not necessarily and it's also road mullets and you can't start catching mullets in the summer around the fly you know and that's everybody in the central in the course out Lots and lots of people catch mullets. They go mulleting for fun, mm -hmm. and they they're not going to go out there with a darn hook in line after a mullet. <laughs> I mean, that much you can rest assured of. But they go set up, you know, the two hundred yards or whatever, and they'll have it as a family outing, and they'll bring in mullets. Now you're not going to capture that mullets, and it's not like it's a giant mouth. But what I'm saying is it's it's a cultural people view yes. this as heritage, as culture, and and that way of life that is being threatened so I, and crushed under the heels of the man. So I will say um <laughs> so to that point we have heard from fishermen that it could be beneficial to pursue gear restrictions in terms of mesh sizes. You know, if we could and you're talking about commercial fishermen. Yeah, commercial. Fishermen. Okay. So <laughs> maximum mesh size. Well, we actually did hear from commercials that we should do something about uh, cast net mesh sizes. But in terms of reducing the commercial catch, or just allowing more of these fecund females to escape, um, if you had a maximum mesh size, that mm -hmm. might let some of your largest mullet not like avoid being captured. Right. And so you would catch these row mullet that are smaller, and it seems. I know in the 90s, the market was focused on a one and a half to two pound fish. Right. And now they like the, the Asian markets tend to prefer the largest row that they can get. But the if Asian this, markets are not now what they were back then right. either. So. so if I mean, do you think it'd be more palatable than if moving into the amendment? Then a, a season closure would be to have something like a maximum gear. I think it mesh. would. I think because the larger fish or when a mesh or marsh, as we say, and and it, it, the larger the mesh is, the more inclined the larger fish. I mean, people is very selective as to what can even be marshed and, in it. So, and we've heard, um, you know, the, the maximum sizes that guys tend to use, um, or and women, sorry, <laughs> from the northern area tend to be a little larger, uh, two and a quarter to two and a half even. Um, and moving down here, you know, two, two and a quarter, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, if we could remove, you know, lower it down to something like itch and seven eighth or something, we that little bit of difference, you could take out those five, six pound fish and allow them to move to the ocean to spawn. You'd still have access to the fishery for a longer period. We would just be allowing these large fish with the most eggs to spawn. Yeah. Well, I understand that. I would, the only thing I would say to that is it would be expensive because you'd have to rehang. You'd have to rehang whatever size you have. I, you know, right now, like I say, two inch or whatever, but two inch is really you know, stretch to four. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's big. Uh, I mean, that's not really that big, though. When I think of a gill net being big, I'm thinking, you yeah. know. I'm just saying, I'm thinking thinking for, are, are most of the landings commercially coming from gill nets or stop nets or uh, strike, strike nets? Strike nets. So mostly just active strike netting. Okay. Yeah, and it's not like you're setting a gill net. Right. <laughs> They're striking on right. a school, and that's it, for it's, much. It's about 15 percent. Set small mesh. Okay. About five percent beach sane, and then yeah, you know, most of that remaining eighty percent is strike net. But there is some smaller catches in large mesh occasionally. Um, okay. And in other so places. so it's eight like eighty percent strike netting, fifteen percent small mesh, Seven. and a little bit of a little bit of saint ocean beach sane. Yeah. So really, no, not much stop netting at all. In oh, that's what I know. The ocean the, saying that, is that's the saying. beach saying. Okay. Okay. So okay. But that, not that, an active haul saying. It's a that's top only. Net. And the only reason I said um, beach saying is because not all of that is coming from the stop net. There is a small beach saying fishery in the northern part of the state. Right. But that's probably only making up five percent of that five percent. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's minuscule. 
but it's not those are where the bigger fish are yes is on the beach they're running down the beach and, and they're going that. out there to spawn and that's only a very small portion you know of the mullet fishery overall especially strike net and then of course out strike net so pam you you mentioned the expense to rehang so how long in your knowledge does a gill net last and how often do they have to rehang well, it depends. You can cut out, you know, you can cut out if you get sharks or whatever. Um, but it'll it'll be worn out if you fish it hard in a year or two. So, I mean, you, you, you know, because you can't hold on to gillnet just so long because if it's laid in a barn yeah. or wherever you happen to put it, yeah. it's going to rot. Yeah. So, yeah. so I will say we've heard from fishermen, not necessarily from the central area, but throughout the state that they have several mesh sizes in their barn mm -hmm. or in their in their stockpile and to target the fish that are around so when there's that mid-size one and a half to two pound mullet they're using something more like inch and a half mm -hmm. and or inch and three quarters and as the fish get bigger and you get that migration to get another that size move up. Mm -hmm. and i I'm just wondering if what your take is, if they have multiple nets, if all they were doing was taking their four or two and two to two and a quarter out of the rotation, would that be a, a significant I, impairment? It, it would really, uh, it would be the significance is that the bigger fish, of course, weigh up more and you can get more money. You don't have to be in to shuck as many fish. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Work, work smarter, not harder, I guess. But I think that that could be, like I say, a lot of these people have different sizes. But I'm not sure about the whole the strike nets. I've always thought of as being a smaller marsh net anyway, because they sometimes would just corral the fish. Yeah. Just you know what I mean? Is the mess size really effective in that way if they? You know, if, if they, they're striking, they surround them. From what we right. know, they're they're not typically fishing it like a purse seine. Right. They're fishing it where they wrap it and the fish then gill. Right. And anything that's caught in the middle, the mullet will just jump out. Okay. And also, when they're pulling it in, they open that circle back up. They're not trying to scoop the bottom up or anything. No. Right. They circle it. So anything that doesn't it gill. gills and they start to pull it in, and that there's an opening and there's also the top, so everything right. jumps out. Yes or then funnels back out of the net. So right. it really is pretty, there's good escapement. You're going to have yeah, it's really the mentality of these fish that are it really stressed out and maybe suffocated in a mass of them. <laughs> but it's not going to be. A lot, of the, like, a lot of the big fish can, if, they, if the mesh is right, they could they could get out. It seems like that. Yeah. And we've that heard might a be, lot of overscoping, especially right. um, up in the northern area, that they're starting to use that four and a half inch stretch mesh um, so that those they have those smaller fish go out and like they're mm -hmm. really targeting a mm -hmm. size fish. Right. So they they expect to get just that size fish. The big ones bounce off the net. The little yeah. ones swim through it. Um, the way that they're fishing it is very targeted. And they want to put their hands on as few fish as possible and just right. mull it. And they did tell us that, you know, during the time of year when bait is important throughout the summer and into the early fall. Um, they are targeting the market wants pound and a half to two pound fish. Right. So they're not going to fish these larger meshes because these bigger fish don't have the same value. Right. Because the bait market doesn't want a mullet that's this big, that's you know that big around. Right. Can't cut that and put it on the hook very easily. Right. 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 Exactly. Right. Right. Cool. So I know we're getting a little bit late on time, but I I just want to give one more call if anyone had any ideas for management that we could uh, relay to the commission next month. Anybody else here does? Kane, if he has anything, so just come on. Okay. Like I said, I mean, <laughs> like Pam said, the, the fishery is definitely pretty concentrated up, yeah. up that way. So it's not as common down here. I just want to thank you especially and everyone for their input. This is really helpful. Yeah, forming our decision on men. Yeah, we need to protect I have one heritage. Question. I do have one question. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Tom, if the idea is to let the some of the fish get 
out of the bays, you know, through the inlets. You know, if, when you get out, when the fish does reach there, hmm. are we going to allow them to keep fishing out there versus fishing in in shore? Inside the bays. I mean, do you target so much escapement to get out and leave them alone? That's the, the ultimate question. If they make it, what's the chance of them actually being able to go offshore and spawn? So I think they run, they run the beach and they get fish there. And I think to that point, you know, a seasonal area closure for the ocean might be something to address that. Um, just an idea off the cuff, <laughs> but I mean, if you you, you, you if, if you work them inshore, then then you say, okay, we need to get enough to get offshore, and you and you manage to get a sufficient number of fish offshore so they can give you next year's you know year one class. You you have to give them the space to do it. You know, you you have to say, okay, they got out. Now we're going to let the bigger fish that got whatever fish got out to go spawn to go spawn. And we're going to count on them to replenish the population for the next year. Of course, every year is different on how the conditions are. But if you don't put enough fish out there and, you know, and let them go do what they need to do, you're not going to have the younger fish in the next couple of years to go catch. I think that's a great point that really this issue boils down to escapement we need to let it spawn um so we need to allow more to spawn um, yeah i mean you, you, you it, look at the way they manage salmon in alaska you know of course they have the ability to count all the fish going up a certain river and they say we're not going to open the season until we've had enough fish escape up river past the you know where they allow the fish in before they open it so that's how they control it there. We don't have that luxury to count fish like that. But I guess there's ways to say we're not we're going to allow <laughs> do some adaptive manners to make sure enough get offshore. And and that's ultimately what you have to do. You have to put enough fish offshore to maintain the population. And and then put, you know, and if you do that Right, you got to protect them there to make sure that all of a sudden you don't have, like you said, it's five percent stop net now. What if it's, but what if it jumps up to fifty? But also, but, but is it, uh, it's important to note that stop. the stop net is not the only ocean fishery. People do strike net in the ocean, especially around Cape Lookout on the shoals. That's even pretty. historically right. unimportant. There was fish camps set up in in uh, oh, yeah. the bite of Cape Lookout, yeah. and they would have them. From you know July, I'm sure you know July. Well, that was a fish camp set up on in um, Onslow Bay on Browns Island, where I mean there's photography of that. Yeah. So and so these these fishermen would go out to the shoal and catch them in the Have you seen them? And there's still people that fish in the ocean down here. We heard from the public that there's some guys that that will go out in the ocean and strike nets. So it's not just limited to beach sands, um, but I do hear that's. I, I hear that it might be something to look into for an ocean closure um, or an ocean restricting that for a period of time to allow the fish that have escaped out of the inlets mm -hmm. a period to spawn. Um, so, yeah, that's great. Point. Yeah. That was my two cents on it. You got to get enough fish offshore to have enough for the next year. Thank you, Tom. All right, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate yeah. it. Back to the chair. So I'm, I'm <laughs> suspecting. <laughs> For the two seconds that we have. I'm guessing we don't need a half an hour to talk about agenda items for the next meeting, right? I don't, don't think mean, so. And actually, that is. That's our January. That's, that's up gonna, to, yeah, that's up to you. Um, we did. We don't uh, have anything to vote on at that January there will meeting. Be, as far as I know, there will not be anything to vote on. Um, it will be, again, an update meeting. So I'll give you an update from the November meeting. Um, and we will um, uh, have a, the presentation on stock assessment. So that was the one item that we have on. It's just an informational presentation um, and we'll have one of our stock assessment scientists here 
Um, so Pam, if you want to grill them about that, um, that would be your yep. opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> you can believe it. <laughs> so, um, but that that's all I have. So this. You know, of course, is an well, opportunity. If there's anything you well, want to tell you, I've got pictures here. Uh, you can let us know, or if you, yeah, and and I'm always available, um, all the time, as my husband says. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have anything that comes up, you can just reach out and let me know. Yeah, yeah, it would be nice to hear the updated flounder landings. You know, from the MRIP wave and then the commercial stuff. You know, just for the fall. Okay, y'all. See, here's 63 pictures of the beach scene fishery. <laughs> that was taken 20 hours, uploaded 20 hours ago. So this was yesterday's fish. Yeah. That is that. That is why I do not want to see stop right there. I want to see this go on just exactly the way it has been. There's 63. Is that a there's, there's our farm all tractors. Is that, is that stop nets? That's, that's the, stop net. That's yeah. in solder pad. Mm -hmm. Okay. You see, they run the dory out. That's how they set mm -hmm. the net. Yep. Did they already strike it? This, this is not striking. This is beach sand. Yeah. Did they already uh, put the beach sand out? I know that's what they're doing right here. Yeah, see, yes. there's the stakes for it. That's the end of the stop net right there. And on the end of it, he says, I mean, that's their tractors and whatnot. I mean, I look, this crowd, they, they, this crowd was at the scope of me. Is that Joey? At Joey, Joey and company. Yeah, Jamie and Joey. And it says, Joey and company. And company. company. Today, I got to watch a tradition that's been going on for 150 years. That's the fish month of salt path that they're stopping at the airport making. When the temperatures drop with a favorable wind called a mullet blow, these fishermen who learned this from their forefathers, fathers, uncles, grandfathers, will haul out these nets with the intention of catching striped or jumping mullets. In times past, a crew would have rowed a dory out with the nets and pulled them in by hand. Today, they will use, <laughs> they will use motors on the dories and will use tractors to haul in the nets. Tractors I saw were farm malls and looked to be from the 40s or 50s. Mm -hmm. Amazing workforces that serve farmers and fishermen for the long haul. Now that's cool, people. Yeah. We cannot <laughs> let that stop. That's all I want to tell y'all. That's a good. That's a good note to end the meeting on. So we can have a motion to adjourn. I'll second. We got a motion to adjourn and a second. All in favor of that? Aye. Aye. All right. Thanks, Kane, for jumping in. I know you. I know you were able to come in late, but but I know. Thanks for coming in. Yep. It was good to see you guys. Sorry I was weren't here earlier. Yeah. So we'll see everybody in January. In January will also be a bit more. It'll be an informational meeting. We won't have anything to vote on, and so we'll have the same option, right? We'll have an in-person and a hybrid. Or, or yeah. that one will be. Oh, that one will be web. Right. So we'll, we will have an in-person option in at the CDO, like I told Pam. Okay. Okay. Just as a listening station, so we can okay. do that for you. Well, I, I, I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad to see all y'all tonight, especially Fred. Yes, of course. <laughs> and Fred, when you're on Harper's Island, you can come to the museum. I Thank know, you. I will. Right there. You tell my friend Eddie. Well, we're on. Thank you, Jay. Oh, you're welcome. I think Tom jumped off already. Oh, okay.